October 12, 1983. This is Joe Todd, an interview with Roger Baker. Mr. Baker, where were you born? Uh, Stigler, about two miles south of Stigler. And when's your birthday? December 17, 1910. Who was your father? Guy Baker. Guy Baker? Yes. Where was he from? Well, he was born in Arkansas, at Snowball in Searcy County near Marshall, Arkansas. He, he moved to Oklahoma with his family when he was five years old. How come they came to Oklahoma? Well, it was the new frontier, and uh, I suppose conditions were not too good there at Snowball, where they left. What year did they move? Uh, well, let's see, he was born in 1889, it'd be 1894. Did they settle around Stigler? Well, yes. Uh, well, I think they, they came to Tomahaw and stayed a while there, and then they lived over at Enterprise, west of Stigler, which is in Haskell County. Mm -hmm. and, but, and then they moved to, to this place south of Stigler. That's where I was born, so it must have been shortly before 1910. Okay. Who was your mother? Uh, Buna Trent. Where was she from? She is from uh, Cave City, which is uh, in Independence County near Batesville, Arkansas. When did she come to Oklahoma? It was about the same time, although I think it was uh, probably a couple of years yeah. later, probably around 1880, uh, 1896 or mm -hmm. seven. Now you mentioned, was it your grandfather or your great-grandfather was killed? My great-grandfather. Tell me that story. Baker. Well, he was, uh, this was uh, during the Civil War and he was a farmer, lived out there. Uh, in fact, the place is called Baker Holler on Calf Creek, just the west of Marshall, Arkansas, between Marshall and Snowball. Uh, and he had uh, cattle, a few cattle, milk cows. Of course, farms those days were self-sufficient, you know. But these raiders, bands of outlaws would come through the country, confiscate and take away anything, their cattle. Uh, supposedly he uh, hid out a cow, a milk cow, and maybe some other things. These people found out about it and they came back and killed him and his son. Uh, now, my dad told me which, that he was hung. And I believe that's tr true. And someone has told later that he was shot, but I believe he was hung, and he and his son both. They're buried there on the old farm site. I've been to the, the grave site. Okay. Uh, what were these uh, renegades called? The well, uh, I've heard them referred to as Jayhawkers, mm -hmm. but there's, I'm not sure that that's correct. There's some other bands. I've heard another name. I don't recall what, what it is now. But they're, they're bands of outlaws just roaming the country. What did your great-grandmother do after her husband was killed? Well, this is uh, some speculation. I know she let, uh, lived there, continued to live there. She raised some children and uh, in fact she raised some children that were not her own. I found this out through some genealogical study, and uh, she's buried there at the, in this. In the same cemetery? Yes. Um, so how many kids did your great-grandparents have? Oh, I mean, I can't tell you for sure. I'd say about eight or okay. nine or so. Okay. My grandfather's name was John Calvin. Baker. John Calvin Baker. 
He's the one that was killed. No, that's my grandfather. Oh, your grand, I'm sorry, your grandfather. <laughs> okay. My great grandfather was Zebediah. Zebediah Baker. Mm -hmm. Uh, have your fam has your family always been farmers or ranchers? Yes. Okay, and that's kind of, that's kind of work your father did. Yes. Okay. Um. Did they have any trouble coming to Indian Territory from Arkansas? Because it wasn't a state at that time as a territory. Did they had to get permission to come in. I haven't heard anything like that. Okay. Although. Uh, there was trouble occasionally. I, I believe I heard that uh, uh, some some group of people tried to run them off of their mm -hmm. their farm south of Stigler. There were shots exchanged mm -hmm. during the night, and uh, but there was no further trouble after that. Did he? Um did he buy land there or did he rent land or because this is also the time when they had the allotment you know, the Dawes Commission came through oh is that right well you recall uh, I said they they lived at Enterprise now one of the daughters of John Calvin married a full-blooded Indian and he had an allotment at this place okay. and my grandfather bought some land from him a hundred acres for the family farm. Okay. As a child, what kind of chores you do in the farm? Oh, yeah, we had we had a self-sufficient farm. My uh, we raised hogs, we had chickens, uh, of course, milk cows, and uh, we worked our crops with horses and mules. And we had, uh, we burned wood, no other fuel. We cut our own wood. And uh, as soon as I was old, old enough, I started milking cow. Mm -hmm. I, I have a certain cow to milk. And I had to milk her morning and night. Uh, and we separated uh, the cream from the milk and sold the cream. What did you, you get for it? Oh gosh, I, I really don't remember. It wasn't very much, mm -hmm. but we, uh, we had this cream separator and we'd separate the, the cream and store it. And, and we had a five gallon can and we'd ship the cream to the Blue Valley Creamery by express. Now that's, I believe that's in Nebraska, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, what's by express? Oh, this was train, okay. by train. Uh, we'd take it down to the depot and put it on the train mm -hmm. and with, a, with a tag to the Blue Valley Creamery. I'll tell you what, we didn't know what sour cream was worth. We, we were worth a lot of money and didn't even know it. That's right. <laughs> we had sour cream. This, this stuff, by the time we got a five-gallon can of it, it'd be sour, you know. But they used it to make butter. Hmm. Okay. Um, how much land could you plow in one day with a walking plow? I plowed many an acre with a walking plow and, uh, and one team. That's a pair of mules or horses. And uh, the plow was small. It'd be a 10 inch plow, probably, or maybe even a 12 inch if you had a large and team. That's the blade? Uh, that's the house larger slice it would cut the pla the point was 12 inches wide and uh, and walk behind this plow i'd say uh, maybe an acre a day mm -hmm. which was best to plow with horses or mules oh uh, mules were seemed to be more steady sometimes the horses is a little too spirited to, little harder to control. A mule learned to walk in a furrow and I, I think the mules work better. So you like the mules better? Yes. Yeah. How much wood could you cut in a day? Oh, uh, let's see, a rick. Now, 
We used a crosscut saw, two man crosscut saw, and of course axes and, and wedges. Uh, a rick of wood was, uh, well, we could cut a rick of wood, depending on how many. My brother and I helped my dad cut wood, and uh, we could cut uh, firewood. That's large sticks, you know. Uh, we'd cut, uh, we could cut two rig pretty easily and split it, mm -hmm. saw the tree down. This in one day? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, two rig of wood, no problem. My dad split the wood and my brother and I saw it. Uh, but he, we, and our stove wood is something different. That, they are small sticks. That's, this is for cooking. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my dad would split that, and we'd, uh, he would uh, try to encourage us to saw faster, and he'd tell us he's gaining on us, and, and man, I'm telling you, we'd have a time, we'd give out and have to stop and rest pulling that crosscut saw. How long was a crosscut saw? Oh, let's see, they're different lengths, uh, five and six feet. Which one do you use? Which length? Yeah. Gosh, I don't remember. Uh, I imagine about a five foot mm -hmm. saw. Which was the best wood to cut? Oh, oak. 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 Why, uh, well, post oak. We call it post oak. And uh, that's what we cut mostly mm -hmm. for fuel. Okay. Blackjack is, uh, we had some blackjack, but mostly post oak. Okay. Splits easy, see. We never cut a nail. You can't split that stuff. Is that what they call piss ellum? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. We used to cut that. Um, when did you start school? I was five years old. My uncle, who was a pioneer school teacher here, Ben W. Baker, was teaching at Havana, which is um, oh probably uh, three miles southwest of Stigler. And he let me start when I was five, which is probably shouldn't have done, but I went to school one year to him, and then I started back at Stigler. But I had to start in the, all over new at Stigler mm -hmm. when I was six years old in the primary. What was the name of the school where your uncle taught? Havana. Just Havana School? Havana. One room schoolhouse? Yes. How many students were there? Well, I have a photograph made when I was there. And uh, I'd say there's uh, oh, between 30 and 40. Mm -hmm. Now, was that all 8th grade to 12th grade? Oh, that's all grades. No, let me see. Uh, Probably didn't go to the twelfth grade. I'm not sure. Maybe the eighth grade. How did one teacher teach all the different grades in one room? Yes. How did they? How did okay. They do that? Uh, each grade would be seated in a, in a different area, and while he's teaching one group, the rest should, are supposed to be studying. Mm -hmm. And he would come to this group and teach them and, and hear their recitation. And I don't know how long, you know, maybe 15, 20, 30 minutes. And then he'd go to the next group mm -hmm. and tell them to go ahead and study their lesson for the next assignment. That's the way they did. Did the older students help the younger students? I don't recall that they did. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, of course, some of the students in the higher grades uh, helped each other. And when well, you're going to school in Stigler, you started in Stigler 1916. You said you were six years old. Maybe you're 70. See, I was born in December almost oh, that's at, right. at that's the right. end yeah. of the year. Okay. And uh, I'd have um, been 17. Huh? Were there any organized war efforts during World War One in your school? 1917, 1918? Yes, I can remember a few things. Uh, uh, I would have been a, 
1918, so I'd have been seven years old. And I remember buying these big chief tablets and uh, for our nickel and pencils. We had, you could buy cedar pencils for a penny and uh, colored uh, enamel had those two for a nickel and I know uh, I remember buying a tablet from uh, the uh, variety store man and he said uh, you be real saving with that paper this is because of the war see and, and, and scarcity uh, and I can remember uh, even uh, some community effort like making bandages or clothing. They, we had a organized effort to sew and make clothing for the Belgians. Mm -hmm. This was when they were invaded by Germany. And uh, in fact, I remember an old song about sewing for the Belgians. Hmm. How's it go? Well, let me see now. Gosh, I wish I was a Belgian. People sewing for me everywhere. I don't remember now this happened. If I had time to think about it, I could resurrect it. Mm -hmm. Did you know anyone that came over the Trail of Tears? No, I don't. I didn't. Yeah, I knew a few uh, full blood Choctaws, uh, like my uncle Billy Goins, uh, who from whom uh, my grandfather purchased this farm. Who he lived a quarter of a mile from us, so he had other land. He didn't sell it all. Mm -hmm. And we had a man named Frank Robinson, a full blood Indian, north. I mean, south of this our place, he was he spoke Choctaw. Hmm. In fact, he he's taught, he he and his family conversed in Choctaw. Ever hear any stories about the trail? Not many, no. I really didn't. Mm -hmm. Or did the Choctaws not talk about it much? I didn't hear it. Uh, yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Well, I, wish, I remember going to town here, hearing the Choctaw standing around talking the Choctaw language. Did you learn any Choctaw? I didn't learn any, no. Okay. Do you remember Armistice Day? Yes. What was that Armistice. day like? Well, there was a, we were close enough to Stigler, we could hear the whistles. You know, a lot of the, the gins and a lot of the uh, plants and factory, whatever factory they had there had steam engines and they had steam whistles and they blew their whistles and bells everybody rang their bells when the, and during the night we they shot uh, well they shot anvils is what they did this makes a loud noise and at the blacksmith shop. I, I, I never did see it, but we could hear it a mile and a half away. And uh, those explosions, they How used, you shoot an they used gunpowder. And I, I think they'd take, I understood they'd take two animals, put this gunpowder between them, turn one upside down over the other and light it. And he'd blow that other anvil off, see, make a loud noise. Hmm. The pressure when that by the of the explosion just really made a boom. What's your first memories of downtown Stigler? What the town look like? Oh, uh, my dad used to take us. My brother and I see he was just a. A less, little less than two years younger than I. We'd go to town with him on Saturday in the wagon. The uh, streets were dirt, and but they oiled those streets to keep the dust down. 
And Stigler was very busy, all practically, I guess all the stores were occupied. They had numerous grocery stores, but we'd run up and down the streets. He'd give us a quarter. Of course, you could buy a bar of candy for a nickel and a soda pop for a nickel, and we'd drink soda pop and eat candy. Just have a big time. What year was this? Well, I'd say I was probably six or seven years old. I was along about 18, 19, 20. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd go home with black, oily dirt on. We See, we wore these knee pants. And we'd be barefoot. Our legs would be dirty black up to our knees. <laughs> Who was the guy that oiled the streets? Do you do you remember? Oh, the, his name? Yeah. Oh no. no Where'd they get the oil? Well, I don't really, I don't know that. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when they paved the streets? No, I wasn't here. I wasn't at Stigler at that time. Nineteen mm twenties. -hmm. Were there many flappers in Stigler? Oh yeah. What'd they look like? How'd they dress? Well, you, I have some photographs of the, of the high school girls. So one thing, they had this, they wore these dresses about knee length, and they had a, the belt, uh, or where the skirt joined on to the top part was low. <laughs> and below the waist and uh, they wore hats and these hats were pulled down over their ears belt hats mm -hmm. and of course uh, i guess you know, summer they wore straw hats that's the main thing i remember about what they wore who had the first car in Stigler? Oh, I, I couldn't tell you. As, when I, as far back as I can remember, there were several cars. When did you see your first car? I don't remember that. I don't remember. I guess it was when I came to town with my dad and saw cars there. I, of course, I can remember when cars were not very plentiful. Uh, one thing about um, everybody had horses and buggies, almost, uh, and the, when the cars began to appear, now horses uh, didn't know about these cars. I'm telling you, you had a hard time keeping a team on the road if a car came down the, the road. They were afraid of cars. Mm -hmm. hmm. Did you have much trouble? Oh, with sure. <laughs> Sometimes my dad, he'd, he'd jump out and go around and get the horses by the, by the bit, you know, <laughs> hold them uh, till the car got passed. Yeah. And uh, hmm. but they'd, they'd see this car come and start shying off the road toward the bar ditch. Mm -hmm. hmm. What kind of wagon did you have? What brand? Uh, I think we had a John Deere. Of course, my dad used to talk about Peter Shatler and uh, Springfield and of course he had, I remember when he had a wagon with wooden spokes or wooden wheels with a steel rim around it and then later he bought a wagon with uh, steel wheels. Now those wooden wheels, you know, you have to soak them in water pretty regular. Uh, uh, they'd shrink and the tire would fall off. Mm -hmm. Which was the best wagon? Oh, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. I, I don't know. I think those three brands were all good. Mm -hmm. uh, they were they were plentiful. Plentiful. A lot of people had Springfield. A lot of people had Peter Shetler and, and John Deere, of course. Yeah. How much would a new wagon cost? Oh, I don't even know that. I don't have any idea. Mm -hmm. Ever change a wheel in a wagon? Ever have to change them? Well, no, no, you didn't change any wheels. You just had four wheels. I mean, if you broke a spoke or the tire came off, all oh, you Oh, well, I guess uh, you'd just jack it up and 
take it into the blacksmith. The blacksmith did all the repairs. Mm -hmm. Now I've helped grease the wagons. I remember very well how that was done. They had a large square nut that held the wheel on. And uh, on the tongue, or at the hitch, where there was a double tree. That's the name of the device that the harness was hooked to. There was a pin in that double tree to hold it on the tongue. And on the end of this pin was a large wrench. We'd pull that pin out and loosen the nut, kind of take the nut off, get the wheel by the top and give it a jerk and be sure not to jerk it all the way off. Just jerk it off part way and it'd sit right there like that and you'd apply what we call axle grease to the uh, axle. Then slip the wheel back on. And about the frequency with which you, you greased these wagon would depend on when you started to hear the wheel squeak. Uh, I was going to say, so there was really no set time or set well, frequency. No, no set time. Yeah. Of course, you didn't know how far you traveled or right. just whenever. Well, once in a while, you know, you'd check them. Just, you could look in there and see if it looked dry. And, and probably we wouldn't wait till the wheels started squeaking. Mm -hmm. That's the only places you grease in the wagon? Yes. What kind of wagon sheets you have? What were they made of? Oh, they were made of duck, cotton duck. Mm -hmm. I don't remember ever having them. Uh, I've seen a lot of, I've seen some wagons with uh, bows, oak bows and, and wag wagon sheets or, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I don't believe we ever had one. How long did you live in Stigler? Well, I graduated in 1931 and, and went to, enrolled at A&M College in, that fall. And I never returned except to visit. Yeah. Um, did the depression affect you much in high school? Hmm. Well, it did, but I didn't know it. You know, I was poor, boy, but I thought everybody was. Uh, I didn't think much about it. Mm -hmm. You take your lunch to school every day? Oh, yeah. yeah. What did your lunch consist of? Okay. My mother would make various things, and most, of course, every morning for breakfast, she'd cook a, a big pan of large biscuits. And most of the time, we'd have two sandwiches, biscuit sandwich, one with a fried egg and one with a piece of home-cured bacon or ham. Wrap it in a newspaper. And we walked to school a lot of the time. And I remember carrying that under my arm. And, of course, it, I'd kind of rub it a little bit and... And sometimes I'd wear a hole in the newspaper, though I, my biscuit would be showing, <laughs> which is kind of embarrassing, you know. But uh, and then she'd make uh, uh, cinnamon uh, and butter rolls, and uh, and like, well, my dad had an orchard. We'd take apple, an apple, quite often, and uh, and he. He grew sweet potatoes. And I remember taking, we'd take a cold baked sweet potato. That's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you raised most of your food then? Oh, so yes. The depression didn't affect you that much? Really not, really not. It, it, of course, I know my dad was had considerable stress uh, because he had bought this farm at a fairly good high price. and. Uh, he had trouble making his payments, but uh, I didn't. I don't remember hearing them discuss it very much. They didn't complain, as far as I knew. But uh, we had plenty to eat. Uh, I mean, we grew. And in the summertime, our staple was 
whippoorwill peas. We ate a lot of whippoorwill peas. Of course, we still had cured uh, bacon that uh, that we'd eat up until the in the spring until hot weather began to get rancid. You know. Yeah. Did you do your own butchering? My dad, yes. My did dad did him? his own butchering. Did you help him? Well, yeah, I'd, I'd do something, but I didn't learn to butcher. Mm -hmm. I, I'd, I tried to scrape the hog, hair off the hogs, you know, and uh, I just do a little odd job, help with keeping building a fire to yeah. heat the water. And... What time of year would you butcher? Oh, that was an uh, interesting thing. Uh, we'd, uh, we'd begin to get hungry for some fresh pork. Uh, after eating peas all summer, and uh, and of course we ate salt meat we'd buy at the store, but uh, we'd watch that for a norther, maybe a cool spell would come in and just wonder if is it cold enough to kill hogs yet. And uh, of course my dad would always know. You uh, mean usually by the calendar. Yep. He went by the calendar. He didn't go by the temperature because the weather could change. You had to wait till it's cool enough to keep the meat from spoiling while it's being cured. Mm -hmm. Of course, he cured it with salt. How long did it take to cure the meat? Oh, he had packed this meat in salt in a box, wooden box, store it there for, uh, I don't remember. I, I didn't know. How many days did it, it have to remain there? But he knew, he knew how long to, to keep it there. And, uh, or maybe he checked it, it, it maybe some way he could tell. But after it was cured, salt cured, he'd take it out of this box, and wreck, uh, uh, rub all the salt off that he could, and uh, hang it up in the smokehouse. And we'd smoke it with hickory sticks, green, mostly green hickory sticks that wouldn't flame. It just sat there and moldered and give off a good smoke. How long did it take you to smoke it? Oh, it's, we'd smoke it for days. I probably, you know, time was a lot longer to me then. I, maybe two weeks or so. So you went to A&M in 1931? Yes. Do you stay on campus? Well, no, not the first semester. Where'd you stay? Well, I, uh, I didn't have any money. Okay, you got a job for the student farm? Student farm, about... It, about, uh, I think it's about nine miles south of per uh, Stillwater yeah, per at Perkins, yeah. called the Perkins Farm. <laughs> We'd work a half a day on this farm and we got our room and board. Then we'd go to school in the afternoon. They had an old truck that we'd drive to school at noon, attend classes in the afternoon. That was the first semester. Mm -hmm. What did you study there? What, what was your major? Well, I started out uh, in School of Science and Literature, I was taking free medics, so. mm -hmm. and uh, but I later switched to agriculture, got my degree in agriculture. Okay, that first semester, did you where'd you stay? You say you didn't stay on campus. Did you live at the student farm? Yes. Okay. I had a little kind of a it's a sort of a shack there with bunks and. But we ate, now the family, the, the operator, the manager served uh, meals and, mm -hmm. and they had good meals. Yeah. How many people worked at the student farm? Oh, well, there was uh, four or five. What were your main duties there? Well, we had milk cows, milk cows, and uh, it was a, just a general farm. Uh, they had uh, chickens and uh, we'd We'd uh, harvest feed. Of course, in this in the fall, uh, I remember hauling bundles of sorghum bundles out of the field. I was by myself. Take this team and wagon out there and 
And boy, that was a hot and dusty job to uh, haul those bottles in because they were already cut before school started and uh, store those things. And then we'd have to feed these animals. So you basically did the same thing you did at home. Yeah. Stores and farm. Right. You said you had a little shack to live in? Well, it was, uh, well, it, I guess it was an old, old dwelling, uh, something like that. How big was it? It wasn't very large. Uh, I'm not sure now, I don't recall too well how, how big it was, but it was about a half mile from the headquarters where the manager lived. How many people lived in each building? Y'all live in the same building? Yes, the students all stayed together. We had, our bunks were, uh, I guess, all in one room. Mm -hmm. See, and then you took your meals at the big uh, house? Yes. Okay. What was the guy's name that ran the student farm? Johnston. Or Johnson. Johnson, I believe. What's his first name? Uh, let's see. I don't think I can recall what his first name was. He was a he was a good guy. He was pretty stern with us, but I liked him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you graduated in thirty five. Thirty six. Thirty six. I was there five years. Yeah. And you say you were in ROTC. Yes. Okay. Uh, who was the commander of ROTC at A and M? <coughs> We had more than one, uh, Colonel Strayer and Colonel Cotton were two of those commanders. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who was your favorite professor at a and <laughs> Well, that'd be hard to say. I, see, I, I majored in agricultural economics. I had a lot of co courses over in the School of Commerce and uh, oh, I like those economic professors. I had some economics courses over there, and uh, as well as, of course, in our, in our agriculture classes. Do you have classes in Old Central? No. We didn't have any classes in Old Central? I had, I may have had some, some of the electives over there, uh, you know, attended a mm -hmm. few, uh, maybe short courses. Yeah. No regular classes, no. Mm -hmm. Okay, 1936, where'd you move to? Antlers, Oklahoma. Antlers, Oklahoma. How can you move there? Well, I, I got a job, uh, with the uh, Department of Agriculture on the new farm program under the Roosevelt administration. I was to be assistant to the county agent. That's, that, that's for my- What were your plan. duties? Well, of course we had a lot of uh, paperwork to do and, and on this farm program and uh, we had, had to measure crops although we hired additional people to measure land. And I was just the assistant to the county agent. Mm -hmm. I'd help him run terrace lines, which that what didn't have any relation to my job, but you know, he'd, we swap work and uh, the whole staff worked together. Yeah. How big was that at that time? Uh, the population, uh, I'd say it was around 2,000 or maybe more. Mm -hmm. Typical county seat town like Stigler. Mm -hmm. How long did you stay there? I was there less than a year, about nine months. Then where'd you go? I went to Medill. Medill? Uh -huh. You went there in 37? Yes. Thirty-seven. Same job. Same yes. Kind of same work. job. Who'd you work for down there? Who was the county agent? Yeah. Dale Osmond. 
They are lost money. Dale O Z M E N T. Still lives there, Kingston. Hmm. Ever do do any work with the Forest Service in Southeast Oklahoma? No. And then you worked there until '41. Well, it was in April in '42 when I was called. See, I had a commission. And I, I was just called to active duty in 1942. And that was with the Army Air Corps? Yes. And what were your main duties in World War II? What'd you do? Well, I was, I was getting up a little old for, for combat duty, so I had administrative jobs. My first assignment was at, at Waco, Army Air, see, Army Air Field. Waco Army Air Field. And uh, what'd you do there? Well, I started out in the personnel department in the headquarters building and just assisting around whatever they told me to do. What was that uh, air base you used? Was that training base or what? Yes, right. a basic training base. Okay. Did the uh, Army and the Air Corps have the same basic or was it separate? Same I mean, what? They had the same basic training for all oh, the no, army. No, it was, it was uh, of course this was army, but it was uh, not like the other yeah. other uh, like the, the infantry, infantry or artillery. No, they, they it was no, it was all together separate. So we're strictly just a basic training camp then. Yes, just okay. basic training. Just How many troops were there at Waco? Gee. Uh, as far as the strength, uh, I'd say probably two or three thousand. Yeah. How long did you work there? I was there uh, four years. No, no, wait a minute. I was only there two years. Mm -hmm. I was there two years. Now, I did go to a school, a special service school at uh, Fort Meade, Maryland for one month while I was there. Let me see, I, I believe, yeah, I, I also had uh, a tour of duty with a special group. I think this was, they never did tell us for sure, but it was supposed to be a crop harvesting corps. We, we went to Fort Worth and trained on field uh, camping and uh, we were there uh, at Fort Worth, uh, at Fort Worth Air, Air Base, that's uh, Shepherd, no, not Shepherd. I forgot the name of the air base now. It's called Fort Worth Army Flying School at that time. But uh, we we camped out. Mm -hmm. Really didn't do too much. Uh, just basic things while we were there. Actually, we were just waiting for orders, maybe. Yeah. But we never did get them. They finally... Uh, disbanded the unit and we went back to our home bases. Where were you when the war ended? I was at Laredo, Laredo Army Flying School. Was there a big celebration when the war ended? Well, yes, yes it sure was. <laughs> What'd you do? I, I don't recall uh, the event uh, especially. You know, I just hadn't thought about it. Our main objective and, and desire was to get home. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, uh, of course, people wanted to get home. Uh, they, a lot of them uh, were, gave up some of their benefits and were not very careful about getting out of the service. So. Mm -hmm. and just the main thing was to get home. Did you return to Medill? Well, of course, my wife was from Medill and her family still lived there. Uh, uh, we uh, returned to Medill and then I contacted my old department, uh, 
agriculture department, and which I think was still called the Agricultural Adjustment Administration then. And they assigned me to Tishomingo, which is uh, 12 miles from Medill. Or they gave me a choice, and I, I chose to go to Tishomingo. Of course, you know the law then required uh, employers to give discharged uh, veterans uh, a job. Started out the same job, the same salary, $150 a month. Same duties? Same duty, yeah. Okay. Well, Mr. Breaker, I want to thank you. All right.